finally happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's so great to have you here, Alan. Uh, this, Thank you for having me, Remy. Pleasure. I'm very honored. Pleasure, yeah. pleasure is, is mine. And uh, it's, I've been planning it for, for the last few months, really. It's been, it's been such a big endeavor. And obviously, without certain people, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I feel a m mixture of feelings. I, I am a little bit emotional because it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. so, it's so exciting to, yeah. to, to, to have something yeah. like this. Yeah. Uh, and get it started, but uh, yeah, it's it's stressful. There's an anxiety yeah. as well. It's 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 yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's an ov overwhelming mixture of of, of feelings. Uh, mm. But I'm 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 extremely happy that you are my my first guest, mm -hmm. and we can talk about your book as well. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you? How have you been? Because I, apart from um, bumping to you. Um, Few we weeks saw one ago, of the, the office, didn't we? But apart from that, yeah. I haven't seen you for yeah. months, yeah. and we haven't spoken for months. So, how have you been in this Not lockdown? Not too bad, really. I mean, it was tough the first couple of weeks because I was just doing every bit of work from home, and mm -hmm. I wasn't really talking much to people because I didn't want to bother people too much. Um, because um, the, our colleagues who felt so overloaded, I wanted to support them, but by not necessarily by ringing them. Yeah. So I was doing a lot of emailing and stuff like that. And then I sort of allowed myself the opportunity to talk to people a bit more. Um, I started doing training. Okay, um, yeah. A couple <clears throat> of days training up at the office, face-to-face um, -face training, that is, small groups. Socially distanced groups. I think we are we are the two people from the trust that yeah. still carry on face to face yeah. we, training. We're very special for you, we you are. for that reason. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps they thought we would get on the boost too readily if we, we weren't <laughs> kept occupied. So that's given me quite a nice variety, and uh, I've embraced the Zoom culture. Okay. Um, I'm doing loads and loads of audits using Zoom. And I'm quite enjoying it, not least with your your lady wife. I had a lovely audit session with her um, um, a couple of days ago. I, yeah. I do you know what I don't know what to think about Zoom. I find it really difficult when there's more than three, four people, mm. and then you have on your yeah. monitor screen or your phone screen, you have you know whoever talks, their face comes up, and then they disappear. Yeah, I, I uh, couldn't do it on my phone. I've got to yeah. have a proper monitor, yeah. So one-to-one, -one, fine. One-to-one -one is better. Yeah. I don't mind, you know, the meetings as long as they're small. You know, I can, I'm fine with those. I am thinking about, you know, um, adapting some of my short-form training, stuff on autism and well-being, to try and deliver it by Zoom. Um, but I think I'm a little bit of a way away from that at yeah. the moment. Yeah. I mean... I don't. I, I much prefer to train face-to-face, uh, -face, definitely. Yeah. But Zoom is a reasonable substitute. And, you know, certainly um, you can get to more people. Like, um, you know, I'm part of the PBS network. And yeah. We're going down the road of, because we can't use the university facilities at the moment, of yeah. delivering sessions via Zoom. Well, that means we're not limited to numbers then. We could have, you know, quite a lot of participants. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I've, I, yeah. I don't know whether you've noticed, because I, I, I did, that because people don't see each other that much face to face, mm. they crave. It is nice. This, 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 this human, yeah. human contact. Yeah. And uh, even bumping into, you know, people from HR, finance, people who I don't really know personally. Mm. Mm. You end up spending quite a long time chatting with them about their families, about you yeah. know how 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 the virus has affected their lives, yeah. in private and professionally as well. I yeah. think you know I think the current situation made us just a little bit more mindful of others, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah. I think we we sort of tried to show a little bit more care to one another. Yeah, uh, I know that sounds a little bit pious, and you know, but. I think it's. I yeah. think it's quite appreciated, I, really. Do you know what? I love it. Yeah. And the, the strangest thing happened to me last weekend. Uh, I had a shift in one one of one of our homes. Um, really busy because certain people are still yeah. shielded, being shielded, shielded. Yeah. Uh, so we're having a break around tea time. We're having something to eat, and suddenly the telephone rings. I run to the office to answer the phone. Wrong number. Right. Usually. 
It would be okay, okay, bye yeah, bye. Yeah, yeah, it'd, it'd be concluded very swiftly, yes. I ended up talking to this chap for about yeah. 15 minutes. 50? 5 oh. No, f- 1 5. 15. Oh, wrong 5, yeah. Well, but still, that's still quite a yeah, lot. For wrong it? number. Yeah, yeah. Wrong number, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so he, 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 was, he was looking for, for his friend. He, you know, misdialed yeah, one of the numbers. Okay. Uh, he yeah. asked me where did I where did I call then? So yeah. I told him it's it's a nursing home, and he oh how are you coping in this coronavirus? Oh, okay, yeah. And it, it turned out that he was he was shielding for so many months, and he was quite yeah. quite lonely. Ah, uh, people who are having to shield, they exactly. especially probably feel that, don't they? So I th- we, we're lucky, aren't we? Because yeah. we're working and yeah, we've yeah. had the interactions with others. And for us, it was really business as as, yeah. as usual. Yeah. So I, I I really hope that this will remain once this all blows over yeah that this this yeah. sort of human contact will be so, yeah. will have priority yeah. over things like zooms and texts and messages yeah. and, and 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 emails yeah. uh, and and from my point of view i think the zoom is here to stay though mate I yeah, really do. yeah yeah and it makes sense doesn't it you know why would you get uh, 20 or 30 people into a room yeah. get them all to come to a venue from different places you know, mm. when you could do just the same sort of thing, you know, through video conferencing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly, yeah, true. you know, I envisage, you know, doing Zoom stuff for audits sort of indefinitely, really. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, certainly, for, you know, it's certainly <clears throat> part of it, you know, definitely. And um, I'm just glad not to have to drive all over Bristol and South Gloucestershire. Um, I saved so much money on petrol yeah. it's yeah. just ridiculous and because i've got really big engine in my car yeah. uh, hundreds I, yeah. I i saved hundreds of pounds yeah. Yeah. yeah um before we kick off with with discussing your book yeah uh, for for our viewers listeners could you could you very briefly tell us who you are and and, okay. and what do you what do you do yeah well i'm alan nuttall um I'm a nurse. I I've, I've qualified as a nurse in 1979. That's over 40 years ago, yeah. Remy. Um, that's 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 when yeah. I was born. <laughs> oh, you, oh, I hate that. Uh, yeah. But I started working in health and social care in 1974. I worked as a ward manager up at Stoke Park for quite a few years. Then I got involved in... Um, well, I got involved in opening a, a very big project which got people... Um, with very complex needs out of hospitals. A, a, a big and pretty successful project. Um, got involved in other projects as well of a similar sort of nature. Um, and um, increasingly got more involved in supporting people who are challenging, doing training with teams around those subjects, which has sort of led me on to my current role. Yeah. I've got this grandy, grand title grandiose title some people might say <laughs> uh, positive behavioral support manager uh, slash quality auditor um, that's a mouthful it is a mouthful <laughs> yeah but i've been waiting for a, a title so grand as that for 50 years <laughs> nearly so you know I'm, I'm making the most of it so that that's what i do at the moment really yeah. i i do a lot of training and um uh support planning around um behavior management um it's a really great job really because i end up yeah. talking to meeting loads and loads of wonderful people i've 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 got i've got an extract here that that sums up alan oh really uh, yeah. yeah so alan has worked for 45 years in care and nursing profession wow yeah. I mean, the, the the wealth of experience is just crazy, yeah? So he was a ward manager and home manager for 30 years. So you are a positive behavior support manager now and quality auditor, and you are also an associate lecturer at the University of oh, West, yeah, West of England. That. Although yeah. I don't do much of that anymore, really. Okay. But it was nice to be asked, and uh, for a while I've done quite a lot of uh, teaching of nursing students. And as you know, I, I, I always try to sort of do all sorts of different sessions. You know, I do a yeah. lot of training around autism or mental health needs, um, well-being for staff. Yeah, I'm, that's... Yes, yeah. I'm particularly sort of interested in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. Because I, 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 I want, in, in the near future, I want to get involved in, in physical well-being and mental yeah. well-being comes, yeah. come, they come together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so we're here to talk about your your book. Yay. Okay. So I yeah, as I as I mentioned it to you earlier, I, I've read it 
mm-hmm. several times. Yeah. Uh, I find it extremely interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. For, for for various reasons. Uh, I'm glad you found it interesting. It, it was. Yeah. Quite quite interesting. I, mean, I, I wrote it to be informative and helpful, but I would hate for it to be boring. Yeah. Do you know what? I, I have learned so many things. Uh, even though I, I've been working in health and social care for about ooh, 17 years, mm. I think now, I've never worked with people with learning disabilities of course no no you haven't it's really, always no. been it's always been elder care yeah. dementia yeah. and yeah. and mental health yeah uh, so f- f- for several reasons it, it it wasn't such an easy read mm. for me mm. uh, there were certain terms yes. that i that yes. i that i've never heard of yeah uh, certain acronyms yeah. you know uh I, but i tried to avoid acronyms where possible so i'm yeah. sorry about that no no, no actually. i yeah I've learned something because I had to look them up. Yeah. Things like, uh, and actually some of the things I asked Agatha and she, she, she was very kind to ex- explain to me. I've never heard of Fragile X. Ah, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. When I asked her, was, is it an X-Files? What, yeah. what is it? What's, what's going Fragile on? Fragile X. Do you know what? I do sessions on that as well. Yeah, and, there you go. You know, sometimes people mishear me and they think I'm talking about <laughs> Fragile Eggs. <laughs> Oh, fragile legs, even. You know, <laughs> really? Ten minutes into one of my sessions, sorry, fragile legs. What do you mean, Alan? <laughs> you know, so really, you know, but, so but I, f- I enunciate it very clearly. Yeah, now. Yeah. Fragile eggs. Yeah. But for for someone who's uninformed, so yeah. who, someone who hasn't worked, this would be because c- obviously things like CQC, PBS, people might not 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 know it. But that that will give them a chance to, to look yeah. it up and, and just and just learn about it. Yes. But there are other reasons why, why I found it maybe not difficult to read, but certain chapters, certain sections of chapters, yeah. really brought me back yeah. to my well nearly a decade as a yeah. proper carer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad it I, sort of hit, hit had, home in that I, way. I had so many yeah. emotions. Yeah. Because uh, we will we'll explore it further about carers and what it, what is expected of them, etc. Et but I certain things that that you that you've written that I thought that's exactly what I what I felt. That's exactly what happened. Uh, certain scenarios mm. uh, that that you that you uh, talk about there. Uh, so that's one of the things. But I think another thing that make makes this book slightly difficult to read is that it make it might make some readers uneasy about especially things about Stoke Park Hospital mm-hmm. so certain practices mm-hmm. uh, that were used in early days mm. of, of, of hospitals mm. yeah so uh, for someone who's really experienced in health and social care mm. they can say oh yeah yeah, yeah that, that's what we used to do mm. uh, but things have changed and blah 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 but if 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 someone completely new uh, and they don't really know what carers do, what mm. nurses do, it might be it might come to a little bit as, as a little bit of a shock. Mm. Yeah. 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 I I can I can see that. <clears throat> but it it was in the past, you know. Yeah. I yeah. mean, but it's all true, you know. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, but you know, it's quite common for a ward of um, eighteen people with extreme physical disabilities as well as learning disabilities to be supported by just free staff you know for all their essential care needs for you know um meal times it was literally you sort of by the time you got everybody up and washed and dressed it was probably about half past ten yeah you know it was hard going to be honest and you know and just the same as now people were very dedicated The, the it was just trying to work a system that was um, very ill-resourced and also very isolated as yeah, well. Yeah. You, you know, why you, know, you had a few bad practices as it's, well. It, it, yeah. it's, I, I find it fascinating. It, it is scary to think that these things happened. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I really, I generally find it yeah. fascinating. Things like, you know, people didn't have meaningful activities. No. Uh, there was no privacy no, uh, things, yeah. the, things, the typical um, ward had a dormitory with about 20 or 30 beds in it. Sometimes if it was a more modernly built ward, um, you know, there might be bays, you know, 
banks of six, but there was no privacy for, yeah. for people. And they didn't always have their own individual clothing as I well. I was going to just say that laundry, yeah. Pe- yeah. people used the same clothes, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. They they were they went all into one big laundry room. They were washed and then yeah. distributed. Sometimes, I, you know, I did work on wars in the 1970s where um, clothing was kept in like a central room and it was doled out to individuals. That was, by then, I think that had become, you know, far more infrequent. Yeah. But, you know, washing laundry wasn't done on the walls. It was sent um, in big sacks to a central laundry in Glenside, actually, in, in uh, fish ponds in Bristol, right? Yes. And, yeah. of course, you know, al- although um, <coughs> it was all named, there was no guarantee that it was going to come back. So that pe- was a cause of extreme anxiety for the folks who, who lived there. Because they didn't have a lot of possessions as well. Yeah. Yeah. So if they, had, it, if they had a piece of clothing, that was all they had. Yeah. And, they, and if, they, if it, if it yeah. went missing... You think how much we treasure our items of clothing. Yeah. We're probably not great examples of that because <laughs> we're not really fashion gurus, are we? No, no. However, <laughs> you know, everybody has their favourite clothing, don't they? Yeah. Right? And yeah. it has associations, you know. Uh, but, you know, so if we were to lose stuff... That would be really yeah. upsetting, but I think that was quite a common people uh, experience for yeah. people um, living in long stay hospitals. And and obviously something that's bread and butter for, for us now, things yeah. like risk assessments, care plans, person centred approach. Oh, right, care plans. I when I first um, started working at Stoke Pike, everybody had a file, and what you would find was. A whole year would be summarised. No, a whole decade would be summarised on an A4 sort of piece of paper. Um, a lot of it seemed to date from the nineteen early nineteen sixties. Um, you know, the people start to writing at least something down about, about individuals, but it was a totally random set of um, incidents. You know? Oh my God, that's that's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, when you go when you go to any any nursing home to their archive room, it's it's yeah. pa- it's packed with folders because yeah. everything is yeah. written down. And there down. weren't any like individual notes for people on yeah. a day to day basis. You wrote a report. I think of my my generation, we probably started having individual diaries or sequences of, okay. of okay. notes for um, the the people who lived in <clears throat> um, Stoke Park, who referred to themselves as patients, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about different terms yeah. a, a yeah. little bit later, but uh, yeah. Um, so, when did the, the change started occurring? So, when we talk about seventies, eighties, even nineties, when did you see th- things changing? Approaches, attitudes. Yeah. I mean, when I first started working at Stoke Park, um, there was a lot in the air about community care. You know, preparing people to live in the community without any great evidence of it sort of happening. Um, um, but it wasn't really until the 1980s that people started opening small houses, really, where oh. people went out to, to, to live in, you know, ordinary communities. Um, so that didn't really start until then. Um, but as, as far as attitudes were concerned, I think those evolved over the years really mm. you know people just gradually got more into the swing of having more individualized approaches towards um, indi- um the people that they support i can't say that there was one defining moment yeah. it was part of a a big cultural shift over many years really um and i don't think we should ever take it for granted no. um, there's, there's plenty of examples that we you know We've come across over the years where um, where um, abusive practices have been very common, where just petty abusive practices like expecting everybody to sort of get up at a certain time. Um, it's like insti- know, so, institutional yeah, abuse, yeah. yeah. I know this for a fact because in one of my training groups last week, um, it was a new member of staff and she said that was so in the previous sort of care job that she worked in. It was a norm for everybody to have to get up at a certain time and be ready for breakfast at a certain yeah. time. So yeah. 
Um, I don't think we should ever take for granted that we're there when it comes to um, good practice around support in health and social care. And I, you know, our our dear friend Vicky, uh, yeah. she, well, I, I, I try to talk to her about Stoke Park because she works worked there as well, yeah. and 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 she 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 yeah she she tells me these these horrible stories about you know one hairbrush or hair comb yeah. being used for the whole unit yeah. of, of of you know 20 residents yeah. uh, t- one of the wars I was on uh, to the latter part of my student training there weren't enough socks one day there weren't enough pairs of socks for um, the folks who lived there there were about 30 people living there and there were probably about 25 pairs of socks you know it's Ridiculous, you know, yeah. and there wasn't anything you could do about it because, you know, it wasn't easy to get hold of money to go and, and buy socks. Um, the hospitals were in very isolated locations. Yeah. I mean, you can't really get the feel of that now, but no, Stoke no, no. Park was really out on the edges of town. When I first sort of arrived, it was one Saturday afternoon in October, uh, just before I started my nurse training, I got um, put out of my taxi at the, the entrance and it was weird because it was just so quiet. A car drove past. You half expected tumbleweed to go past as well. <laughs> it was just it felt so remote and sleepy. Because we, we, we recently moved to uh, Almondsbury and I was told that where we live now, Hortham Lane, Hotham, yes. there used to be... That's right, Hortham Hospital, yes. Yeah. Yes, I think some some neighbours said that it used to be called Colony. That's right. Really. In fact, I can remember um, several of the older ladies referring to it as the Colony. They would say it was part of their colloquial speech. They would wow, say, okay. "Oh, I'm just going to go to have a walk in the Colony around the Colony." It's, it, the, it's, the, it's beautiful. The, the grounds yeah. are absolutely yeah. stunning, and we we yeah. love it. I think but, that was yeah. sort of like the generic term for. Um, the institutions, whether okay. um, initially conceived in the um, early part of the 20th century, it was a common sort of phraseology before the, the National Health Service took them over. Um, yeah, um, I can remember seeing that on documentation at Stoke Park. The old documentation, it was headed Stoke Park Colony, and that was a common sort of... Um, terminology yeah, yeah yeah so let's 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 talk about more about terminology because again i find it really fascinating because certain terms appear out of nowhere mm-hmm. we use them for certain i don't know 10 10 years maybe even shorter yeah. and then they are deemed inappropriate for for whatever yeah. reason and we, we have to start using yeah. different ones a great example will be I've written this ghost manual about moving any techniques. And at the time, and that was 2014, we were told to use residents for people yeah. we support. But then we couldn't figure out what, what sort of term to use for mm-hmm. carers, HCAs, support workers. And we were told to use handlers. Yeah. So you had handlers and, re- and residents. But your book was published last year, but I, I guess you've been writing it for, for, for many years. Oh, yeah. And you use term service users. Yes. Okay. Now, as far as I remember, last year we were told that this is not yeah. appropriate anymore. So we should change it to people yeah. we support, which sounds very obvious. Because <laughs> yeah. these, these are people that yeah. we, that we the support. The terminology seems to wear out very quickly, doesn't oh. it? Like... But I gave you the example about how um, the folks who lived at Stoke Park and all the other hospitals would refer to themselves as patients and the staff would refer to themselves, to uh, to the folks yeah. they support as patients. And I think, again, I'll give credit to my generation uh, in the late 1970s, early 80s to introduce in the terminology of residents yeah. because it seemed more appropriate and that had a good run. Um, but I think residents sort of got associated more with care homes. Yeah. So, you know, that wasn't really appropriate for people living in support of living uh, circumstances. So, you know, what do we call those people? Tenants, perhaps? Well, uh, tenants, that's that's what, what's being used in supported living. Yeah. I think tenants, because yeah. I, I heard Agatha yeah. say that. And service users seem to quite a respectful terminology. Yeah. Yeah. However, you know, 
I, I get the point. Uh, you know, yeah. people who we support is um, far more respectful um, form of yeah. terminology. But, but al- it, although I heard it used as as PWSs. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it, it becomes a sort of almost like a cliche yeah. or, a, you know, um, but this extends to terminology for people who are learning disabilities generally. I mean, I qualified as a nurse for the mentally subnormal, which, you know, is a hideous phrase, you know, isn't it? But that my, would... My jaw just dropped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, interesting. And though, we're, we're not talking about ancient history, are we? No. I've got something else to add to that. I was actually reading a Wikipedia page about somebody who'd um, been executed in the Far East and had presumably had a, a learning disability. It was a bit of a core celeb for um, a few decades ago. And <laughs> this up-to-date Wikipedia um, post um, page referred to this gentleman as a mentally subnormal man. And that is tw- 2020. However... Mental subnormality, the term mental subnormality, that was enshrined in the law, Mental Health Act at the time. It was probably seen as being an improvement on mental deficiency. Um, And then the term mental handicap took over. And that had a common, that was a common sort of phrase. Well, there's a word disturbed as well, mentally disturbed. And now we've got terms like learning disabilities or learning difficulties, which are seen as more respectful but they'll wear out in time yeah <clears throat> well you're absolutely right yeah w- who knows in 10 years we might have completely different terms yeah. for for people we I support think what, what happens is they acquire stigma or they're um they're corrupted in some way like um the term spastic for example i mean that that is a clinical condition around muscle um tone um but that was corrupted yeah, you know to was, the term yeah. as a term of abuse um in american circles um there was there used to be a journal called the american journal of mental retardation um and the word retardation is often um abbreviated to retard and used as a term of abuse it wouldn't be regarded as acceptable terminology now and i've heard people even not not that long long ago use the term that someone is demented as yeah. well, which I find absolutely appalling yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. So, so as far as uh, people with learning disabilities, mm-hmm. is this the correct current term that we use? Just it, I think. It, well, yeah. Who's to know? I mean, <laughs> but you should. You talk to. I mean, I do a little bit of work at you with a couple of people, or used to do. Um, one favours the term learning difficulty. The other favours the term learning disability. Is there any difference? Or well, I think learning difficulty, sometimes that can get confused with uh, you know, conditions like dyslexia. I think it's used a lot in educational, okay. um, uh, the educational field. Okay, and, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's a term which some people are learning disabilities, which is the term I tend to use. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I'll, I'll stick with, with this one. Yeah. But there are other terms that are used as well, like intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities. Okay. Yeah, there are academic journals which uh, have those sorts of um, forms of, of terminology in their titles, you know, so it's evolving all the time. Okay. Brilliant. I think it's all about stigma and how yeah. the terminology acquires stigma. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I mentioned earlier that the book brought me back to, to you know... I hope it wasn't too traumatic no, 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 for you. No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't. I, ha- yeah. I, ha- I had really great memories from yeah. HRH as well, Humphrey yeah. Epton House, where, where, where I used to work. Uh, but very what, what, I, what I usually think when I... Uh, let's say you see an advertisement of, I don't know, BUPA, Mm -hmm. whatever, they're advertising jobs for carers. Mm -hmm. You very often have this upbeat music in the background and you have Mm -hmm. this smiling uh, carer Mm -hmm. uh, and then the resident is smiling as well. They've Mm -hmm. got a beautiful plate of food in front of Mm -hmm. them and and there's like like a happy feel about it. Uh, That's not really what carers work 
look no, like most no. of the time. But if you if you talk to most carers, I'm sure you probably yeah. had these conversations. You know, they will say how much they love their job. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah that, that's it, very true. Yeah. It's one of my little things that I ask people to do in um, training, um, you know, right at the start. You know that bit which... Uh, Staff always hate, yeah, you know, yeah. saying who you are and <laughs> you know a little bit about yourself. I also ask them to say, "What do you love about their job?" And they all come up with such wonderful, inspiring sort of things, and it's it's perfectly yeah. genuine, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I I I just feel that general public doesn't really they well they don't really realize what it what it means to be a no. carer. No, I don't uh, think so. They, I don't think they fully understand they, the, they, they really the stressors and strains of it. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Because um, obviously, the, the, there's there's you know uh, the amount of learning that they have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the amount of training sessions an average mm-hmm. carer needs to attend mm-hmm. to be fully updated and allowed mm-hmm. to work is just mm-hmm. insane. I think the sheer level of detail that you got to remember yeah. about an individual is really yes. sort yeah. of hard. You know it. It's not like you can run off to a care plan and look things up every no. five minutes. You've no, got to no. try and remember. I'm, f- I'm very conscious of this, you know, about, you know, triggers and, you know, people sort of having to keep in their head the things which are likely to cause distress to individuals and make them... Absolutely. And, and, and you have... Be challenging. Have the weight of responsibility yeah. as well. People very often yeah. don't realise that whatever you write, you know, whatever you com- complete a daily diary of a yeah. person or an accident form, it's a legal document. Yeah. So it, it can be used as, as evidence in a court yeah. of law. Mm. Uh, mm. But if you ask a carer, they will, they will say, it's just a comic book. It's, yeah. it's, it's no biggie. I do it yeah. every day. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps that's because we have never really sort of fully explained the implications to yes. people. And then, then there's obviously their, their uh, you know, there, there's challenging behavior. There, there's there's physical verbal yeah. aggression. There's there's so many things, and uh, I I I, ha- I have. I, I think that being a carer is as complicated as oh, yeah. difficult as being yeah. in any profession yeah. in the world, if not more yeah. complicated. Uh, mm-hmm. I know a lot of of my friends who 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 are you know, in construction, and whenever I tell them you know what my job used to be. They, they said that they, they wouldn't be able to do that. Although, interestingly, uh, I, I had this experience as a manager giving out jobs to people, and it comes across as well when I you know, find out about people's histories in training. We have an awful lot of people coming into care work who, who have done other things. Yeah. You know, they've, been, uh, they've worked in pubs, they've, um, they've um, worked as builders, they've been accountants, all sorts of stuff, and... You know, almost um, all of them say, you know, I wish I'd come to the, into this job before. You know, it's really great. You know, so um, it's a pity it's not paid that well. It is a bit, yeah, but it's just so, so labour intensive, isn't it? So, so yeah. despite all of the things that we mentioned yeah. that the carers have to go through, we, we are paid. Yeah. We are paid so so little. Well, it's, which I think is why it's so important to have a focus on people's yeah. well-being. Yeah, because and that, that's one yeah. of the things you know. I mean, there's so many different aspects, isn't there? Where we, we talked about you know the concerns about physical aggression, verbal aggression. I mean, verbal aggression could be just as un- unpleasant as um, a physical I aggression. Know. You know, the sort of cutting things that people say or racial abuse, swearing, making. Comments about your ethnicity or your body shape, those sorts of things. Oh my God! Yeah, that, yeah. That that brings me back to one of the gentlemen that lived in one of the homes. Uh, yeah, he had no filter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You've got a spot. Yeah, <laughs> she's fat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we supported a lot of people on the autistic yeah. spectrum who yeah. don't fully understand social rules and are, are perhaps a little bit more frank. Then you've got things like. Um, it's just physically hard work, it especially is. when you're working with people with lots of needs. You're doing shifts. You know, you might have a sleeping room, which isn't all that brilliant if you yeah, get sleepings. Yeah. And, and on top of it all, the folks that we support, every now and again, well, very frequently, they deteriorate and die. Yeah. And that is... I think tremendously traumatizing for the um, the, fo- the I, folks who support people. I never realized that it it had such an effect on me 
mm. uh, residents dying. Mm. Uh, and I think eventually, at the end of my decade at HRH, I, I have burnt out a little yeah. bit. And in, in the beginning, I didn't even know what it meant. Mm. Oh, I, I heard stories that someone left because she's burnt out. Mm. Uh, but, but eventually, I, 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 did, I did understand what, what it meant. Uh, being, you know, witness to so many deaths, and yeah. you, whether you like it or not, yeah. whether you want to be as professional as you as you as you can be, you get attached to 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 to, to your Absolutely, to your yeah. service users, yeah. and some of them are such wonderful characters, yeah. and 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 you sometimes you wish, I wish they were my nan or or my or my granddad, yeah. and 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 you know, so yeah. how how can you know get attached mm. and and feel extremely emotional when they when they eventually go. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that 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 had a massive e effect on me. I, I I had several residents at Hamburg and Hub that I loved to bits, and 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 yeah. I was I was really in pieces when. It's when really they upsetting, and we we tend to have the attitude as people working yeah. in health and social care. You just got to get on with it. <laughs> Certainly, in my, the early part of my career, the idea that you know we should get upset about people dying yeah. who we support it just didn't exist, and I think I went through the same sort of. Yeah feelings that you did after probably after about 20 years it sort of caught up with me a little bit and it sort of you know really sort of came home to me how upsetting it was yeah. that you know these people you know that i supported for many years you know were dying um but i think there's a lot more understanding now i think we give ourselves permission to be upset um a bit more now. I saw that that's been very noticeable in the current situation. You yes, know, where absolutely. Some very dearly loved characters have um, passed away in the the places that we know. You know the the care homes that we we both know quite well. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's more training as well. So there's there's mm. there's a lot of education about how mm. to deal with these things, mm. uh, which brings me s smoothly to the to the next bit. Uh, what when, when we talked about terminology and things that that are mm. inappropriate on, mm. on you know, uh, yeah, we, we 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 shouldn't use them. Uh, challenging behavior yeah. comes up quite quite often. It's become a bit of a cliche, hasn't it? It does. What 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 is it? it it's 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 everything. When someone becomes aggressive, yeah. physically, verbally, it's all challenging behavior. I I have to say, I hate this term. I don't. I think I put it in the book. Actually, I don't like the term. But but uh, it has got a a really honourable sort of origin. Okay. The original phrase was behaviour which challenges services. Okay. The idea was to sort of take it away from you know um, something intrinsic to people's nature and something that they could be blamed for, but more towards something that we could do about do something about okay. or you know about we could change services to accommodate people and uh, respond to them. I'm not sure if I explained that very yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, it, that, that was with the origins. You know, it's, a, it's a very old term, and it's a term which is used very freely in academic services. And so, so there I, Personally, I prefer um, normalising the terminology, talking about people becoming angry and distressed. Okay. Because that's what it's all about. So you want to be more... More specific, what what triggered this yeah. person's behavior rather than call it? Yeah, he was challenging challenged. behavior is yeah. a very sweeping sort of it is um, uh, terminology, and it encompasses so many things. So it's not just about the the verbal and physical aggression. It could be about self injurious behavior. It could be about repetitive behaviors or yeah. socially unacceptable behaviors. Um, you know things like. Um, touching people inappropriately or invading people's personal space. It's a whole range. And I think, you know, just got to be a little bit more specific, to be yes. honest, about yeah. things. Yeah. And also not, you know, it, it's like the other terminology we talked about. It becomes old and corrupted very quickly and a bit of a cliche. But it stayed with yeah. us for quite a long time it, it it i don't think there's an easy way to find an alternative to to no. to challenge because that's why it, it, it remained well, uh, yeah we can flip it around a bit and refer to behaviors that challenge, challenge. we yeah. should probably get yeah, them a little bit yeah. more to the original spirit of the terminology but you know i try not to use it when i you know if i can because um i think it's important to remember the the reason why people do unusual behaviors is because they're upset they're angry yeah. 
They're distressed about something, that's, that's but the they way can't of, express it. That's the way of communicating, yeah. basically. Yeah. But yeah. challenge behavior, whether we like it or not, is a part of, of being a carer. It is, yes. It is, okay? Yes. So in extreme cases, it will be a physical aggression. Yeah. And you, you talk a little bit about potential risk of suffering for, from post-traumatic stress yes. disorder. Yeah. So how, how can, you, can you explain how, how, how does yeah. it work? Um, what does it mean and how, how does it make people yeah. feel? When there has been some sort of research on you know, the impact of challenging behaviour on you know, staff welfare, uh, I know there's other people that are involved in supporting the folks we support, you know, family members and um, other networks. But um, but I, I said tend to, the research was specifically around staff, and you know, and it, it being sort of involved with people are challenging over a period of time, you know, um, causes people to have quite strong emotions, you mm. know, feeling angry about. Um, the folks they support, um, despair, um, sadness, anxiety, all those sorts of uh, feelings. Guilt. Guilt indeed, well. yeah, because you feel like you've let it's, the it's person my fault, down. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's some good evidence that, you know, it does cause burnout. It does contribute to burnout. And um, I, I, I tend to think of it almost like a drip drip effect. And any sort of day or week, um, staff working with people who are challenged in any way or easily distressed, they're exposed to all sorts of different stressors. And I think there's sort of like an accumulative effect. Yeah. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think it, it just wears you down after a while. Um, so I think it does equate a little bit to post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe not in the sort of same way that most people think, you know, oh, being yeah. exposed to sort of major traumas. It's but not like, like, like in the life of, of a soldier or a, no. or, a, or a policeman. No, but if you think, you know, the, the average carer, you know, might have experiences where they have verbal sort of abuse or physical abuse, um, the exposed to situations where, you know, yeah. they're, they're feeling anxious because they're trying to work out why somebody's getting upset and their, their mind's going over time trying to work out what uh, how best to sort of um, support um, somebody. So they're getting the, these little adrenaline bursts all the time. And, you know, by and large, they're overcoming it. Um, but I think it all mounts up after a little while. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the best way to support staff, carers, in, in dealing with, with these, these the post-traumatic st stress? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's one of those things you, you need to avoid happening in the first place. So I think, you know, um, effective post incident support is really, really important. You know, giving people a chance to sort of have a few minutes away from a situation. People just showing concern it's got to be genuine concern. there's something in your book that i really liked it's called uh, promotion of acceptance amongst carers and teachers and it's basically a process where you sit down and you very in, in very in very much detailed way analyze what happened yeah Try and learn from the experience so it doesn't happen again. Because that's a good practical way, which is helpful for both parties, isn't it? Yeah. It means if you identify triggers from that process which you didn't know about before, that is going to help the person being supported. They're less likely to be challenging. And if, the, um, if that happens, that's less stress for the staff as well. It's a win-win, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, Greatly in favour of that, not just a humanitarian caring approach, um, but also, you know, that scientific analytical approach. I think just generally looking after staff is really important, you know, um, showing that you care about staff. It all sounds very pious, doesn't it? But I think it's just... But it works. Yeah. It really works. Uh, yeah. I think for many, many years... Uh, staff were well, maybe not ignored, but there was a lot more yeah. focus on on residents' 
patients, service users, yeah. but not enough on staff. Yeah, just um, giving people time yeah. to talk about stuff, which is bothering them, is really important. But what I what well what was really what I really enjoyed in, in the book, and one of one of one of the scenarios you uh, you described there was about. A gentleman getting taking all of his clothes off oh, yes. and being chased by yeah. uh, by by two two carers. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you who those people were after the interview. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sure but, they won't but mind. But what 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 what, did, what this really shows? So so the, the, the post analysis, these two carers were able to sit down and have a good laugh. Yeah, because it wasn't a pleasant situation for exactly. them because they're in a public area. This young man. I can't remember, because I wasn't there, I can't remember the full details. It was in a park. Or, yes, or, yeah, it yeah. was a public space, but there yeah. Were place, you know, there were people around, you know, walking their dogs or just having a walk <laughs> sort of thing. So it's potentially embarrassing and difficult for them. And, of course, you know, they were mindful of that person's uh, dignity as well, you know, so it was a difficult situation. And... They also had to consider that he might have become physically aggressive as yes. well, because that yeah. was within his portfolio behaviours at that time. So, you know, just sort of handling that situation, getting back to his home safely was difficult and stressful. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, humour is a what we don't want to be is sort of... Um, um, Give the impression that we're laughing at the person. Yeah, there's a very the thin line. The situation, though, was comical, uh, you know. Yeah. There's a very thin line between, yeah. you know, laughing at someone or just analysing what, what just happened. The and humour just, was just... mainly directed at himself, huffing exactly, and puffing, exactly. trying to catch up with this young man who was quite fleet of foot. Uh, but I think in many, many of these, you know, incidents that happened to me, uh, sense of humor and and just laughing at myself helped me yeah, so much that's it especially when i when you know I, when i experience some sort of physical aggression or verbal aggression with with a colleague or two and we just look at each other and and, and just laugh could it yeah it, it, it is funny we're not laughing at the person who yeah. who did it we're yeah. laughing at, at, the, at the situation yeah and uh as long as it helped me deal with it and mm. and, and maybe forget it uh, mm. that's great well you do yeah. find a lot of humor yeah. in health and Social care. Tell me, tell me about you know, it. <laughs> it's fueled by nicotine, caffeine, and banter. It seems, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and you're the great grand champion of of, well, of, of I, banter. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I don't smoke. I'm trying to cut down on the caffeine. It's got to be banter for me, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Okay. I'll 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 um. We'll we'll change the subject a little bit because okay. I I've, I've got I've got a hypothetical situation for you. Okay. Have oh, you, have you have you a ever proper heard, interview question? This have you have you ever heard of uh, multiverse? Right. Um, yeah, I have. But uh, is it sort of like science fiction? Sort it of is sort thing? of. So it's basically yeah. an idea that will that, that there are multiple universes. Really? Next to each other, parallel. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so let, let's imagine that, you know, there's thousands of these universes. And what it means that in each of these universes, there's Alan and Remy. We and, don't and, want and to and think about this. Okay. It sounds hideous, <laughs> yeah. Especially millions of Alans. Yeah. So, so in, in each of this, these universes, Alan will be slightly different. Yeah. So let, let's say that in, in this particular universe we're talking about, you have long, wavy hair. Yes. Okay. But also in this universe, carers are real superheroes. Well, so, they so, are already, aren't they, to be honest? Yeah. So they are treated like superheroes. Yeah. Uh, there's shortages of them, so there's not, not, not very many of them. And you are this long-haired Alan from this universe. You are a headhunter. So you work for this recruitment company. Okay, and yeah. your job is to find the best super carers okay, in the world. Yeah. Okay? So my question to you is, what, if, 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 if you were asked to make a list okay. of, of certain essential things that carers should have... Yeah. Yeah. What what would you put on okay. that list? Okay, well, I've done a bit of thinking about this because I had to interview for <laughs> whole teams in starting out Brilliant. services. I thought it was always good to have people with initiative. Okay, so that was that to me was a good thing, you know, because um, people who sort of try new stuff or take on responsibilities, you know, for that sort of thing. Um, 
it's good to have people's um, resilience as well. Resilience and stamina, I think, are really important characteristics. Um, you know, people are persistent or they're not going to get upset because of setbacks. Because let's face it, it happens social <laughs> care. You have setbacks every single blooming day, don't you? You're Potentially, right. yeah. So um, resilience and stamina. Um, and also the capacity for reflection. There was a little bit of research done. I think I cited it in the book about, you know, um, characteristics of good carers. And this research sort of said that people are a little bit introverted in the sense that they had a capacity for reflection. Yes. They were good people to have because they sort of, you know... So introverts are, in theory, better carers. Um, that's what this little okay. bit of yeah, research yeah. Okay. So, suggested. And I sort of think that, really. I mean, not necessarily introverts in the sense of the people quite sort of, you know quiet although you know, I've had plenty of quiet stuff or, yeah. you know you, you you want to have a mix of temperaments but introverts in the sense that they've got a capacity for reflection and analysis because those are the, the sort of people who could you know really understand individuals and um, particularly in the area of you know behaviors that challenge could yeah. reflect more readily on why somebody was behaving as they are you know not leap to the sort of you know, what's this person doing to me personally? Why is this person winding me up? This person's doing this for attention. All those horrible things that we've heard yeah, throughout yeah, our yeah, careers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are sort of, people have got, yeah, you know, and I don't think you have to have, you know, be a, an academic or a, a, a high powered intellectual to have those abilities. You know, some people just have that naturally. They might not have had a great amount of education, even, but, even, but, they, they've just got that natural capacity to sort of um, reflect on things, do you treat think, people as individuals and respect people. So do, you, do you think em empathy should be on the list? Empathy is definitely on the list, yeah. Definitely, yeah. But I think empathy can be taught, though. Okay. Or rather, it can be nurtured. I mean, I think what is helpful, what I've found helpful for myself and also for my teams over the years is if people understand why people are as they are, you know, if if they know about conditions like autism or fragile X, or if they know people's life histories that um, that they've gone through, you know, the people we support have often gone through traumatic sort of histories. They've lived in long stay hospitals or they come from fractured sort of family backgrounds. I'm very interested at the moment in the subject of trauma-informed care, trauma-informed support. And um, with that, in that sort of model, there's an understanding that a lot of people, well, probably all the people that we support in health and social care, particularly people with learning disability, but other groups as well, have a lot of traumatic experiences. And I think if staff know about that, those histories, that brings out the empathy. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. The empathy is there. It just needs to be drawn out. You know, uh, the, the folks that we support are far more complex than people realise yeah. um, from just looking at them and taking them at face value. I, I also think that important personality trait uh, would be compassion yeah yeah uh, but even things like just being friendly <laughs> yeah 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 uh, friendly sociable people yeah. when you don't have to be massively outgoing you know to to be like that there's a really really interesting thing in the book as well uh and i'm i, I was really curious because at, at the beginning of the chapter it mentioned the name and i thought oh i wonder whether i have it hardy Personality. Hardy personality, okay. yes. So I, I did a little bit of research, and yeah, it looks like I, 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 I yeah. do, I do have it. Can yeah. you, so what, what, what is a hardy? Oh, blimey! Personality. Yes. I put you on the spot now. You, you have a bit. <laughs> I haven't read about this for ages and ages, but I think it incorporates a lot of the stuff that yeah. um, you know. We, I think we it mentioned about, about commitment, yeah, control and challenge, and I think the challenge bit. Uh, 
it's a perfect portrait think, of, 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 of me because people usually when when they see a challenge they they, they see that the universe yeah. is is against I them I think the hardy personality is, is that is the people who feel empowered um, the people who feel that you can do something to support people and change things. Yeah. I think there's a lot of resilience um, exactly. if you've got that worldview. So any challenge, it's just yeah. an opportunity to learn something yeah. and, and you overcome it rather than give yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's... the opposite, really. People who feel that, you know, you can't change things, you know. Maybe the people who haven't had a lot of control over their life and... They just don't feel that anything is amenable to change or influence. So, I mean, the hardy personality is, yeah, I think that's probably what I'm thinking about with the initiative side of things, you know. Yes. People yeah. with initiative, people who feel that they can do something, people who can problem solve. Maybe that's better better way of looking at it rather than the an anal problem analytical solvers. sort of thing. Yeah. No, problem solvers, you know. Um, I think that, that probably incorporates a hardy personality. That's what carers yeah. do. They, yeah. they they solve problems. Yeah, <laughs> they do all the time. Yeah, they don't yeah. realize that. They're no. very nonchalant about what they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just that you know, yeah. a day in in, in yeah. the office. They help somebody. They help people develop over a period of years, and then they give all the credit to the person, which is right as well, you know. But but no credit to themselves because they're just doing their yeah. job. Yeah. So you mentioned that, so that's probably a, a thing which is help staff, helping staff celebrate their successes, yeah. helping them to sort of you know I'm praising staff, again not in a patronising patting you on the head yeah. sort but of. But that's what we've been doing in the trust in the in the last few years, trying to celebrate successes. We have, haven't we? We're better yeah. at it than we used yeah. to be. Yeah. And I think we never we never used to spot things. Um, I think we had a team meeting not that long ago, um, and uh, yeah, we made a list of about 20 odd things that we successfully achieved yeah. and people even didn't realize yeah. that yeah. they they just well, I think that, that is a good coping strategy as well if absolutely. you if you celebrate the stuff that you achieved it, it sort of overwhelms the negative stuff a bit uh, yeah definitely yeah. yeah so as i said you mentioned it a little bit earlier um about that you know being a carer it, it's more or less an, an, a natural thing so would you would you say that being a carer, it's a type of calling. Maybe not higher well, spiritual. I don't know. I mean, um, so many people come from so many different backgrounds and mm. so many different temperaments. So I'm not sure if it is. Um, I think it's good to have an aptitude for it. Okay. But I think, but that isn't the be all and end all. Because you very often hear people say, "Oh, he's a natural teacher. Yeah. He's a natural, you know." Yeah whatever lawyer or or a writer yeah. Uh, yeah. i think the development and training is the thing which really you know enhances people's ability to care yeah. and support and i think the, the, the fact that you've got to have a, like a you know a glimmer of um aptitude there you know it, yeah it's a bit like a carpenter you know if the carpenter is not dexterous with tools there's no way absolutely sort of and we already mentioned several things like you know being resilient and having having yeah. empathy compassion being yeah. friendly uh you know having initiative they're they're so so important yeah. things uh, but as, as you mentioned earlier recently we see so many people from different walks of life yeah. coming to to yeah. social care yeah. uh, the other day on my training i had uh, an engineer yeah. Who who who's had enough of engineering and he wanted to do a little bit of and he joined the bank. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I think that sort of tends to go against the idea it's a calling for like a select few. And if we relied on that, we're never, you know, it's a very labor intensive sort of thing, isn't it, caring? You know, we need thousands of from thousands of carers. So yeah. you know, we have to spread the net far and wide. <laughs> Yeah, but and we're carers anyway because we care after our children, you yeah. know, loved ones, yeah. relatives as well. So yeah, it, it, yeah. it, it is yeah. a natural so, thing, mothers, fathers yeah. as, as as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's got it's in there for most people. It's just got to be drawn out and yeah, nurtured. Enhanced. Yeah, yeah, nurtured. yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, uh, and just to sum up, because we'll we'll be finishing in a minute. So uh, I I want I want the first podcast to finish on a really positive note. If you could look into into the future, the next ten years, where where do you see 
social care? What sort of changes right. do you do you think might appear on the horizon? Maybe once this all blows over with with coronavirus. Okay, right. Okay. Um, I mean, I suppose until very recently, my career was I saw, I've seen a load of changes. You know, the idea, for example, that somebody can have a service completely built around themselves with 24-hour support from just one carer, you know, that would have been inconceivable 20 or 30 years ago. You know, so I sort of see the trend as generally being, you know, progressively, you know, progressive improvement. Um, I think probably more of those services, um, which, you know, probably 20 years ago would have seemed impossible to mm. afford, but they, are, they have been possible to you know, they, they happened and um, more of that. Maybe, I mean, one of the things which has really come out of um, the last um, few months is people using technology more. Um, people using FaceTime and Zoom. People we support who are, you know, not very okay. able people. They've been keeping in touch with their family through video conferencing. So more of that, yeah. more use of IT resources which I think will be new. I think I think it's fair to say that the folks with learning disabilities, they've almost been excluded from the IT revolution. Yes. Because they don't have smartphones. And it's They're so important. Not, they don't have access to IT. Literally a few weeks ago, one, one of uh, our service users joined me during my yeah. moving and handling training via Zoom. <laughs> Yes, and next week I, I'm going to have a similar sort of experience. It's yeah. amazing. It, it adds... Another yeah. dimension to the training because it's not only trainer and the carer. You have an actual person who yeah. will need the support in the future. Yeah. So it's I, I find I just and that's found probably it amazing. another change that you know we could sort of institute ourselves. We could yeah. make that far more the norm. You know, involving people in in every training session. You know, so yeah, because um, I'm also got people that might be lined up to sort of help out with my autism training. You know, so. So that's Brilliant. good. I think, you know, sort of more um, involvement of people we support uh, would be quite good in training. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you think that the attitude towards carers will change, especially after this? You know, all these clapping for NHS and social mm. care. Do you think it, it that, that something's going to switch in people's minds? Yeah. That, that That carers are not low-paid, yeah. unskilled, that they are actually very skilled. And, it was and they, very they are, insulting, wasn't it? When, it was. You know, people sort of implied that because people are low-paid, that they're, they're unskilled. Um, and the last three months, we, it's shown that we can do without actors and footballers and, you know... <laughs> The world goes on, Absolutely. but we need nurses and carers. My only concern is that the focus has been a lot on NHS staff, quite understandably, you know, the saving of lives and treatment and stuff, but carers have been doing a similar job yeah. but probably haven't given, been given the, the same sort of kudos, you know, or, or applause or concern uh, or, or um, plaudits, that's the word. Um, so I don't know. I think there, there will a, will be a shift there, which will stick to a certain extent. But I rather suspect it will, you know. I really hope it will relapse a little bit. You think bit. so? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, because yeah, yeah. Um, I would have yeah. Uh, to be honest, yeah, I don't think it will. I'm, I think it will be better. Carers will be accorded more respect, but I also think that you know they won't be people in the will fall. back to, to to normal. Yeah, a little yeah, bit, very yeah, quickly, yeah. one day. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. attitudes will have changed a bit. Yeah, definitely. But you know, I think there's still a lot yeah. of work to be done to um, ensure that carers get the the respect that they truly well, deserve. Well, it 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 was so nice to be literally within a few weeks changed from unskilled to essential. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah. All all you need yeah. is is a pandemic, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and and everything changes, yeah. doesn't it? And carers had to, they couldn't work from home. Yeah, yeah. They had to go in, put themselves at risk as well. You know, so um, that that was noted, wasn't it, by huge sections of the population? 
Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it. Uh, mm. It's been an absolute pleasure. I don't even know how long we were going for. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in the description of, of of the video, there will be a link where people can okay. buy buy the buy yeah. the book. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I highly recommend it. I think that it's a must for all carers, but I think especially for people who are in any sort of managerial positions. There's a chapter on manage there needs is, and managers, yeah. Because yeah. uh, very often pe people who, who, who are in um, in position of power very often forget what it's like to be on the floor, working hands-on, how hard it is. Mm -hmm. And carers are very often f uh, forgotten. So I highly recommend it to, to anyone who works in, 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 in social care. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it was a really, really interesting read. Uh, and again, thank you so much. That's okay. You're very welcome for for yeah. being here. And you're yeah. my first guest, and my first episode is finished. Thank you so much. Okay.